Hi, it's great to have you here with us at church today. My name's Katie and I'm the women's minister here. If you're at Glenmore Park in the church building today or at Mulgoa in your church, or if you're at home, it is really great that you've joined us today. The countdown is on because in just a few weeks, we're gonna be switching to live services and we would love for you to be here. There's still gonna be a live streaming option, but it's so exciting that we can move to that option. For now though, it is wonderful that we are able to gather around God's word with his people and learn from him. So as we start our morning, why don't I pray for us? Loving Father, thank you so much for the great blessing of technology and all that it's enabled us to do as a church family together during this really strange season. Thank you that today we have this chance to be around your word and to learn together. And we pray that you'll use that to shape our hearts and shape us as your people. Amen. An important part of coming before God in prayer is confession. Coming to God not confident in our own goodness because we know we could never be good enough, but instead confident in the forgiveness offered to us in Jesus Christ. So would you join me in bringing all our faults and failures before our loving, merciful Father and pray this prayer of confession together, friends. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, not loving you as we ought, nor loving our neighbour as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed and in what we have failed to do. We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us. Help us to love you and our neighbour and to live for your honour and glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. During those days, another large crowd gathered. Since they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they will collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. His disciples answered, But where in this remote place can anyone get enough bread to feed them? How many loaves do you have? Jesus asked. Seven, they replied. He told the crowd to sit down on the ground. When he had taken the seven loaves and given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people, and they did so. They had a few small fish as well. He gave thanks for them also and told the disciples to distribute them. The people ate and were satisfied. Afterward, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. About 4,000 were present. After he had sent them away, he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the region of Dalmanutha. Our passage today makes me think one thing. Haven't we done this already? Like a few weeks ago. Trav, we did this, right? Yeah, yeah, I, I remember Chris talked about it. You know, Jesus feeding thousands, baskets of leftovers. Like, we've already done this one, yeah? Today's passage, Mark 8, 1 to 10, is so much like Mark 6, 30 to 44. I mean, they're so similar. Hey, why don't we just replay Chris's message here and like call it a day? Well, we're not going to do that uh, because there are some significant differences between these two events, feeding the 5,000 and feeding the 4,000. Uh, there are a lot of differences. When Jesus fed the 5,000, he was in the region around Galilee and Bethsaida. He was, he was in part of Israel. Uh, when he fed the 4,000, he's in the area known as the Decapolis, the 10 cities, uh, near where he healed the man with the, the legion of demons. You know, he's outside of Israel. So the people he's feeding in each event are different. Uh, Jews and then non-Jews. Uh, this is also likely why the number of leftovers is different. You know, 12 baskets in Israel to reflect the 12 tribes of Israel, God's people, and to reflect the 12 disciples of Jesus, through whom God's going to call a new people. Uh, then seven baskets in the non-Jewish, in the Gentile region, uh, seven reflecting, it's, it's a biblical number of completeness, of perfection. 
And so perhaps it's referring to Jesus uh, calling in the full number of God's people. You know, only after Jesus goes to the Gentiles, only after all kinds of people are invited in, only then is God's call complete. Uh, there are other differences of varying significance, but I want to focus on, on one in particular. If we read Mark 6, Jesus feeding the 5,000, uh, we see that the crowd gathers to hear Jesus. And by the end of the day, the disciples are like, uh, hey, Jesus, why don't you send everyone away to get, get something to eat? It's been one day. The people are hungry, but they can go home or to the local villages or, or forage in the countryside and find something to eat. Back in Mark chapter 6, the people are hungry, but it's only been one day. And Jesus could have, if he wanted to, send them off to find food for themselves. Uh, instead, of course, he feeds them in the wilderness, like God did with the tribes of Israel. Now, when we get to Mark chapter 8, uh, Jesus says this in verse 2. I have compassion for these people. They've already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. If I send them home hungry, they'll collapse on the way because some of them have come a long distance. The people in our passage have been with Jesus for three days and they can't just go and get food from nearby. If they try, they may die. Now, perhaps you're wondering why that's a significant difference. I mean, the people were extra hungry. So what? Jesus is going to do the same thing. He's going to feed them all. So does it really matter that these 4,000 are hungrier than the 5,000 were before? Well, I'm suggesting that it does uh, for one reason. Uh, the one difference I want us to focus on together now is the time spent listening to Jesus before he feeds them. Because it shows us something important about the nature of hunger. This crowd of 4,000 men and who knows how many women and children, they listened to Jesus for three days. And in doing that, they show us what real hunger is. Uh, let's, let's take a guess at a few things the passage doesn't tell us. Now, maybe this crowd, when they first came to hear Jesus, maybe uh, they brought some food with them, you know, some morning tea, a little snack lunch, maybe. Let's also assume, all right, that Jesus didn't talk for 72 hours straight. Like he wasn't literally teaching the crowd for three whole days. Uh, instead, let's say that Jesus would uh, spend the day teaching them, you know, from, from dawn till dusk. Uh, as long as the sun was up, Jesus was teaching. Yeah, maybe he took some breaks for drinks. Uh, but let's say Jesus spent hours and hours talking to these people about God, the nature of his kingdom, and how God's people are to live. What we're seeing in our passage today is the first three-day Christian conference. Uh, you know, you, you arrive at the venue and you hear from the speaker. Then when you break for the evening, you talk to the people that you came with about all that was said that day before going to sleep, uh, then waking up for another day of teaching and discussion. Uh, the things being said from the front by Jesus and the discussions you're having each night are so encouraging, so unlike what you normally think during the day-to-day -day of life. See, Jesus talks about God uh, not as some distant theoretical entity or as some sort of dusty old tradition or as a grim-faced lawgiver. No, no, no. When Jesus talks about God, it's as if he knows him. It's as if Jesus has met God and spoken to him. It's like God is someone you can know. And Jesus makes God sound like the kind of person you'd want to know. He is loving and gracious. He cares for the poor in spirit. God comforts those who mourn. God fills those who are hungry for righteousness. And before you know it, it's day three. And whatever snacks you may have brought with you, <laughs> I mean, they're long since eaten and gone, but you don't feel hungry. Uh, you haven't eaten for a few days, but you don't feel hungry. Because Jesus has been feeding you with something so much more satisfying than food. He's been filling you with a vision of God, showing you 
God, the God who hung the stars in the sky and who knows each hair on your head. The God who is holy and stands apart from everything else in creation, mighty, powerful, majestic, and infinite. Jesus has been showing you the God who wants you to come to him and know him and call him Father. See, the reason I point out these three days is because I think it shows us that physical hunger is far from our deepest hunger. There's something we crave more, something we need more than food when we are hungry. See, when we're hungry, it's our body's way of saying, you need something. And what we really need, past all the temporary fleeting calls of this physical tent, what we need is God. We need a God who can come near to us and make himself known. What we need is Christ. See, the miracle of this passage is not so much that Jesus feeds 4,000 hungry men with food. And we've already seen that he can do that. And it is a generous, loving act Jesus does for the crowd. He feeds them physically. But the real miracle here is in showing a crowd of over 4,000 that they can only be truly satisfied when they feed their souls on God. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The miracle here is that before Jesus feeds their bodies, he has been nourishing their souls by his word. He's been satisfying their souls with the word of God. He has been feeding their souls as the word of God. See, the nature of hunger is this. God has ordained the world. He's shaped and created the world to act in such a way that you require physical nourishment. You, you need to eat to live. And when you don't eat, you get hungry. Now, that hunger tells us, tells you that, that, that you need food and it gives you a language. It gives you the words to understand your deepest longings and needs. You were made to hunger after God. You were made to hunger after God. And it's only when you are satisfied in Him, when you know Him, that you can be satisfied at all. What I mean is this. Now, see, I would never admit this when Craig Hamilton was working here, uh, but every time I eat KFC, I'm always left unsatisfied for one of two reasons. Either I've been sensible and only ordered a small amount of fried chicken, and so I'm left wishing I had more fatty, oily, salty goodness to eat. Or more often, I have ordered and eaten too much chicken, and so I feel a bit like a fried chicken myself, you know, stuffed and greasy. Now look, even without the extremes of KFC, that is what every hunger in life is like. That is what every hunger in your life is like. You can sate it, satisfy it for a time, but you will always be hungry again. Hungry for food, hungry for affection, hungry for acceptance, for assurance, for relationship, hungry for, for meaning. See, ultimately, you're hungry for more than this life can give you. And that's by design. Let's just take one of them as an example. Uh, your hunger for relationship. Now, I think we can all agree COVID has made clear a great hunger for relationship. All this lockdown, social distancing, mask wearing stuff. You've felt it, haven't you? That desire for contact with others. Don't you miss shaking hands with a friend, giving someone that you're not related to a hug? Don't you miss being able to lick a stranger's face? Maybe not that one. But you miss relationships, don't you? COVID has shown us how we hunger for relationships. True, deep, vulnerable, comforting relationships. We're hungry for relationships where you can be safe and, and not be afraid to be let down. Now, COVID hasn't, hasn't made this hunger. It's sharpened this hunger. We see it like never before. And let me tell you, this hunger 
can never be fully satisfied by friends, family, husbands, wives, girlfriends, boyfriends, children, uh, none of it. The acceptance and security, the relationships we hunger for, we, we can get some of it, you know, a taste of it from those around us. But our hunger for relationship can never be fully satisfied because uh, the friends we have, they do let us down. The family we're a part of, look, they're just as hungry as we are. They won't always accept us with open arms because, well, <laughs> they're just human like us. And even, even the very best relationships end in death. We have a hunger for relationship that no one can satisfy. But there is one. There is one who never lets us down. One who, who knows us, all our failings, and still chooses to love us. There is one who wants to be in a relationship with us, no matter who we are or what we've done. One who always welcomes us with open arms. In fact, he had his arms nailed open wide to make sure you can always come to him. And this is what every hunger in your life is like. None of them can truly be lastingly satisfied until they are given to God through Jesus Christ. Every hunger you experience in this life, it's meant to point you to the one who longs to fill you. Jesus spent three days teaching the 4,000, feeding their hunger for God. And Jesus spent three days in the tomb so that you never have to be hungry again. Now, if you don't know what I mean, one of two things is probably happening. Uh, number one, you don't know this all-satisfying God that I'm talking about. You haven't come to Jesus and asked him to show you this God that, that knows you and loves you. This God that wants to satisfy the deepest yearnings of your heart. You don't know this God who is the deepest yearning of your heart. In which case, I guess you need to find out more. You can get in touch with us at church, you know, through our website, uh, through the contact form, or, or by calling the office. We'd love to help you know this God for yourself. Or uh, number two, uh, you know this God, but like me, you don't know him enough. Like me, you are satisfied with the small tastes that I get from God when I pray and read and, and watch church. But uh, you don't dive deeper. You don't often dive enough. You don't dwell longer with Him. See, see I, I know that God is the answer to all my hungers. But I still crave and chase a whole lot of other things because I don't know Him well enough. I don't feed on him enough. See, I've never sat with Jesus teaching for three days and, and not noticed the time go by. I struggle to put off my other hungers. I get distracted by, by so many other things. I feel I so rarely drink deeply of who God is and who he shows himself to be in Christ. Like me, maybe you are too satisfied with the things of this world that, that sate your hunger even though they can never fill them. KFC, comfort, a good marriage, a meaningful work, a happy family, all good things. But like me, maybe you need to go deeper into the hunger you're trying to feed. See the God who stands behind your need for recognition, your desire for love, your, your hunger for meaning. See the God who is the answer to all these hungers. You need to see him, to know him, feed on him in your heart. Maybe, just like me, you're too easily satisfied. And we need to ask God to show us what true and lasting satisfaction is. What it is to experience the joy and fullness of being his sons and daughters in Christ. Are you hungry? And are you hungry enough to see that it's God you're really hungry for.
Well, maybe you've been listening to John just then and you've heard a really amazing challenge for us to be fed by God and his word and to be completely satisfied in him. Maybe for you, your first step then is chatting to a staff member about joining a connect group so that you can regularly be gathering with other people around his word and fueling each other on as you keep tapping into that amazing gift which satisfies you. Maybe you're feeling like you're a bit newer to things here and so you'd really love some help. Why don't you chat to a staff member too and chat to them about doing a course to help you dig into God's word and to keep being satisfied by him. Why don't we all take the chance as well to turn to the person next to us and just check in with them and ask them, how are you going at being satisfied by God? It's a great chance for us to share how we're going in our journey and the ways that we can be prayerfully encouraging and supporting each other as we do this Christian life together. Well, I'm going to wrap up here so that you can turn to that person and do that exactly now. But we really hope that you can join us next week as well to continue doing life together. Thanks. Thanks.